All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maureen Conway. I'm the Executive Director of the Economic Opportunities Program here at the Aspen Institute, and I'm very delighted to welcome you to the third in our roundtable series on reinventing low wage work. Uh, today, we'll be talking about uh, the retail sector. Um, and I, just uh, by way of introduction, we started this series because uh, for the past decade or so in the Economic Opportunities Program, our work has really been focused on uh, helping low-income people get skills to get to better jobs, usually in sectors like allied health and skilled um, uh, trades jobs in construction and manufacturing and information technology and, and sectors like that. But as we were talking with uh, folks who are in employment training centers, particularly as the, the recession hit and people were struggling to find any job. Um, sectors like restaurant work, um, uh, low-wage health care like home health care, and, and certainly retail were important places where people were finding jobs. But often these sectors were not places that people were really thinking about very much in terms of what's the quality of those jobs and, and what's possible um, for these jobs. Uh, but the many, many people work in these jobs. And, uh, you know, and for, for a retail trade in particular, we encounter uh, retail all the time. Um, and it was funny because I was uh, getting ready to come to work this morning and my daughter looks at me like, why do you admittedly look much nicer than usual today? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said, well, we're having this, you know, round table event uh, on, on retail trade. And she kind of looks at me and I said, you know, shopping. And she's like, oh, shopping, okay. <laughs> because, you know, shopping is really a part of our life. And whether it's at the mall, whether it's at the gas station, whether it's at the bookstore or the drugstore, or whether it's online, it, you know, our, our interactions in, in that way really do affect the quality of our life. And strong retail stores are really important in our communities. So having strong businesses and having successful workers is, is really a, uh, an important part of our lives in, in these sectors. And so I think it's really important for us to, to take a look at that and to, and to think about that and think about um, what is possible. Um, so in this series and today, we ask, how can we have both strong companies and successful workers? Um, we come to this, we don't really have an answer at the Economic Opportunities Program, and that's why we invited all of you and, and, our, and our panelists today uh, to have a conversation around this, in, around this issue. Um, and uh, so just, uh, just I'd like to say, for our, when, we, when we try to think about a panel um, for these conversations, we try to think about, okay, we would really like somebody who's you know, got a good employer perspective, we'd really like somebody who's done a lot of work with workers, and, and we'd like somebody who's sort of um, done some, some research on this sector and is sort of a, a smart uh, commentator. And I, and I just want to say that we've succeeded spectacularly with this panel. Uh, so I would like to introduce our panelists uh, uh, to my immediate left, on your right, I think, uh, we have Kim Owen, who is the recently retired VP of Human Resources for Quick Trip, which is a very interesting company that sadly we don't have around here, but <laughs> maybe that's yeah. in the future. <laughs> um, uh, next to her, we have uh, Zainab Tan, Associate Professor from MIT Sloan School of Management. And then following her, we have uh, Carrie Gleason, Executive Director of the Retail Action Project in New York. Um, and I'm not reading their bios, but they all have impressive bios, which you have uh, with you that you can, you can take a look at. And uh, to top it off, we have an excellent moderator uh, with us today with uh, tremendous experience reporting on employment issues, uh, Stephen Greenhouse, labor and workplace reporter for the New York Times. So uh, with that, I am delighted to turn it over to Stephen to lead our discussion. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to come speak here for a minute. Okay. okay. Thanks. I give moderators prerogative. They really okay. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, Maureen, for helping set this up. Thanks to the Aspen Institute and to this, uh, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation and the Ford Foundation for un underwriting these panels about, uh, you know, about uh, the important issue of what's happening to the nation's low-wage workers. Retail workers is the subject today, and they're a very important subject. Uh, you know, in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, all the uh, discussions used to be about manufacturing workers. We were, we were an industrial nation. Today, there are more retail workers than there are actually factory workers. There are 15 million retail workers, only about 12 million uh, factory workers. And um, retail is, is very hip. All these young people want to go work in it. You know, there are all these great stores, uh, Abercrombie & Fitch, 
Victoria's Secret Express, nine, you know, and, and you know, a lot of people are dying to work in these places, but then when you, uh, you know, look under the rock, you see that there are some serious problems at, at many retailers. There are also some terrific retailers, and Kim, you know, is from a convenience store chain, Quick Trip, that is really a model in many ways. So uh, average pay for the nation's retail workers, median pay is just $10.10 .10 an hour. A quarter of retail workers make under, under $8.75 an hour. So a 10 10 an hour comes out to about $20,000 a year, but uh, most retail workers, I think, don't even work full time. So a lot of them just make $10,000, $15,000 a year. Um, now, of course, retail is very, very competitive, and you know, employers will say, you know, we have to hold down labor costs, we have to squeeze our workers a bit. But you know, sometimes I think the whole retail field becomes uh, somewhat of a jungle. And we're looking today at um, how to improve the lot, the lives of retail workers while uh, assuring that uh, the nation's retailers uh, remain successful. Uh, one thing I've seen in writing about many uh, retailers is that they unfortunately often treat their workers, not all of them, but many of them treat their workers like disposable parts that, you know, uh, here today, gone tomorrow. And, and I've interviewed workers who say some weeks my employer doesn't even give me any hours on the schedule. I interviewed another worker in New York that Carrie helped set up and, and Carrie some retail action project that, that, that does a uh, a model job in, in advocating for, for low-wage workers. You know, one, one young woman uh, told me that one week she was assigned four hours, only four hours. She went into uh, her store that day and they said, things are slow, slow, we don't even need you today, go home. Uh, another big practice that many workers are increasingly complaining about is so-called call-ins. You know, some workers tell me that they're assigned two, day, two work days a week and maybe three call-in days. So they're supposed to kind of leave nothing on their schedule those days and call in the morning to see if they are needed. Uh, I've interviewed some Walmart workers who said uh, managers are so inflexible in scheduling them that they had to drop out of their community colleges because there were too many, too many conflicts between their work and, um, and their schooling. Another big problem, which I write about at length in my book, The Big Squeeze, is, is wage theft, which is unfortunately quite a big phenomenon at many retailers. And, and, and in my book, I detail about how this happened at Walmart and Toys R Us and, and, uh, and uh, other, other well-known chains. And, and uh, I, I interviewed this one worker, uh, an Air Force veteran, who worked at three different chains in a row. And each one basically stole hours. Anytime he worked more than 40 hours, they reduced it to less than 40 hours. You know, they, they cheated on him. Toys R Us, Rentway, Family Dollar, you know, they all um, often, uh, to use the phrase, you know, stole, stole people's wages. Uh, I, I, had I had written about an immigrant worker in Brooklyn who worked 60 hours a week and was just paid $210 a week, you know, basically about $3.50 an hour. She said she wanted to look for another job, but she worked so hard she never had time to look for another job. Uh, another big issue we see is that many retail workers don't get much training. You know, uh, there are very good companies like uh, Costco and Container Store that, I know Container Store trains its workers over 260 hours in their first year. And that means they're really investing in their workers. They want you to stay. If they're going to invest that much time in you, they want you to be with them for years and years. And, um, you know, I interviewed a worker at Express who said uh, he had four hours of training and then was on the floor and was even uh, running the cash register after just four hours of training. And uh, he said the place was just a turnstile, people coming in and leaving, and that the company did very, very little, he said, to, to really invest, invest in workers. You know, sometimes you hear about, uh, you know, I've t spoken to Walmart managers who say that they were basically told to push out the older workers, push out the workers who are making $13, $14 an hour, so you could hire people to replace them for $8, $9 an hour. Um, so I just want to emphasize there are companies that often don't do the right thing, but there are other companies that very much do the right thing, that really uh, pay their workers quite well. I know Costco, after four and a half years, pays its workers generally at least $20 an hour, at least $40,000, $44,000 a year, which is basically about twice as much as Walmart. Uh, Quick Trip, you know, Kim will tell you about some of the terrific things they do. You know, Zainab Tan um, has done a lot of 
great research on high road retailers and, and how others should uh, copy them. Um, so just to conclude now, um, retailing is a vast world. Uh, millions of people uh, in our shopping crazed world go to work in, in retailing. Uh, some have very good experiences. Some, unfortunately, uh, get, get chewed up in the process. And you know, I, I, I'm writing about this woman now who's a retail worker in California. She says she has two broken, rotten teeth, and she can't even afford to have root canal work because she doesn't earn enough money and she doesn't have dental insurance. Anyway, um, so Carrie, uh, <laughs> why don't you begin by talking about some of the challenges faced by, uh, by retail workers? Um, thank you for that, that wonderful introduction. I think it was really great to frame. Um, Steve's been doing really great research on the retail industry, and so we'll, we'll see the article soon, we hope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> um, so I, I'd like to first begin by thinking about retail overall. It's really viewed as the litmus test for the health of our economy, and I think this last uh, 2011 holiday sales really shows um, the role that retail plays in our economy and how it really reflects what's happening uh, to working people across the nation. So uh, it was interesting. Uh, High-end luxury retails did extraordinarily well. Saks Fifth Avenue had historically high gross margin rates. And this is their quote. Um, they were up 48% in net income. And gr luxury retail is growing across the country. Um, and these are good middle class retail jobs. They, they are the hope and we need to figure out as workforce developers, how do we help more people access these opportunities in the retail industry? They're, they're good jobs with commission, uh, with benefits and with stability. Yet while Saks was, was thriving, um, what we also saw was that the largest employer of low-wage workers in this country, which employs 1.3 million workers across the nation, Walmart really struggled. They had to discount their already discounted goods and saw flat, flat income rates. Um, they were at about 3%. And it was interesting, Walmart C CFO said, well, too many people were caught in that paycheck cycle, meaning too many people were struggling and choosing between basic es essentials and holiday shopping. Um, and that hurt Walmart. And it's interesting, Walmart, as the largest employer of low-wage workers in this country, um, it, it begs the question, what role can retail play in both boosting our overall economic growth? And, it, and, and what role can giving workers a raise, um, elevating the minimum wage, can, can that play? Um, in terms of, I think what we're seeing is that you know, luxury retail is growing, middle class jobs are shrinking, and more and more people are struggling day to day. And that's happening across the country, but it's really happening to retail workers. Uh, one in 10 private sector workers work in retail. It's very big. Um, and they're really struggling um, on low wages, but also chronic underemployment with few benefits. Um, we're really paying the buck for the retail industry when it comes to, to health insurance and, and other basic necessities, necessities that people need to get by. Um, Full-time work has really become a promotion at retailers like Uniqlo and Banana Republic. And so the fight for the 40-hour work week has really returned. Re retail workers are now trying to increase their hourly profit, not to uh, get a commission or a bonus. They're trying to increase their hourly profit just to get enough hours. And so when we think about advancement in the retail industry, uh, the fact that involuntary part-time work has tripled since 2006 is really the picture that frames it. And whether or not a worker is part-time or full-time, structures everything about their job and whether or not they're going to stay at that job. And I know for workforce developers, we need people to stay in jobs. Um, and whether or not they're going to grow and be able to reach an income that's really going to help them support their families. In terms of what we're doing at the Retail Action Project, we're an organization of retail workers. Uh, we're based in New York City. We emerged out of a community labor partnership uh, that was fighting wage theft um, in New York City, uh, similar to the stories that Steve had shared. We were finding workers, really the bottom had fallen out. Um, and, and what we've been able to do through taking legal action to fight wage theft is really, and also partnering with um, labor unions like the, the Retail Wholesale Department Store Union and the United Food and Commercials Work Workers Union, turn law-violating retailers who had no regard for minimum wage or overtime into model employers. And so I think workers can really play a role in creating the jobs that they need. Um, but they need tools and they need support, and that's what the Retail Action Project 
aims to give them. Uh, we also do really significant workforce development work. Our career development coordinator is here today, Eno Oatoye, who is um, a career retail worker, and, and I'll talk more about the work that she's doing. Uh, we really think we need to be um, supporting retail workers' path towards career security and advancement. Um, retail workers do move from job to job, but we would hope as they move that they're advancing, they're not staying on the same level. Um, and so I'll be talking more about our workforce programs as, as we continue. Thank you. So Zainab, you've done a lot of mm -hmm. research into the nation's retailers and retail employer employees. How do you see uh, the picture. So since both of you talked about more about the employees perspective, let me just take the employer's perspective and, and, and see the under you know, tell you about the underinvestment in, in retail jobs and why that happens and, and, and what are the consequences of this. So when you look at retail employment, what you find is that retailers in, in underinvest not just in the quality of their labor, so quality in terms of low training, uh, very low wages, etc., low benefits, but also in the quantity of their employees. So it was really striking to me as, as, as a person who studies operations management. Uh, when I looked at retailers, I, I, I saw that they often didn't have enough labor on the selling floor. How many of you have been to a store and, and you just didn't find enough people to help you? <laughs> okay, understaffing. You're even laughing. So at one retailer, I found that if they had more labor, if they if they had more hours of employees working on the selling floor, they would make more money. Another colleague of mine from Wharton had a very similar finding in, in, in his study. So why is it that retailers under invest both in the quality and quantity of labor? We should be asking this question. And, and I think there are three main re reasons for that. The first one is something that Steve has alluded to, is that retailers view labor as just um, as a cost to be minimized, not as an asset to be maximized. And, and, and when you view labor this way, it has some consequences. So retail is a really competitive industry. Um, retailers have low profit margins, even the luxury retailers, and, and, and many retailers will have single digit profit margins. What does that mean? They have to control their costs very well. And, 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 and when you look at labor, labor is definitely the highest, you know, most retailers highest, um, largest controllable cost, so, so they approach it um, very carefully. So number one is, is that number two is the performance management systems and the pressure that performance management systems put on the store, store managers to cut labor spending. So, so many retail chains, since labor is such a large expense, um, they evaluate their store managers on payroll as a percentage of sales. So how well they manage this, that expense. So let's look at the numerator and the denominator, payroll and sales. So when you look at store managers, there's not so much they can do to affect sales. So merchandise mix, the merchandise layout, uh, store layout, the location of the stores, the weather, you know, all these things and price is determined centrally. So, so, so there's only so much they can do to affect sales, but when you look at the numerator payroll, um, although they can't also often affect wages, what they can affect is the number of hours and the full-time, part-time mix. So, so when they're under pressure to meet those targets, payroll as a percentage of targets, which are sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly, what they, ended up, well, what they end up doing is when sales shrink, payroll shrinks. And, and they end up cutting labor hours, and, 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 and the pressure is so much that sometimes they revert to um, not reporting the hours that employees often work, which Steve, you know, so brilliantly reported several times. So, so that's the number two reason, the performance management. And then the number three reason is from a business point of view, when you look at labor, you know, when you cut labor, you immediately see an increase in your bottom line. It's very direct and it's very quantifiable. But the cost of cutting labor are indirect, they're long term, and they're not very quantifiable. So when managers try to trade off you know, direct costs versus indirect benefits, the direct cost always wins. And, and unfortunately, many retail managers and investors who invest in retail have a poor understanding of the long-term benefits of investing in labor. So those are the reasons why retailers end up under-investing in both the quality and quantity of employees. And then what happens? Um, let me ask you a question. How many of you have had a bad customer service experience? <laughs> Right? So, so when you don't in invest past, in your in labor. Past five hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happens is even at low cost retailers, right, you don't, you know, you don't 
expect personalized service, but you expect merchandise to be in stock where it's supposed to be. You expect the, the, the tags, you know, the prices to be accurate. You expect the checkouts to be shorter. Um, these operational tasks don't get done when, you don't in, when retailers don't invest in their labor. And when that happens, of course, sales and profits decrease. When sales decrease, payroll dollars, you know, payroll budgets decrease along with that, and then you know, you can't invest in your labor again. So that's a vicious, that's the vicious cycle. And unfortunately, the sorry state of retailing from a business point of view, bad jobs, bad customer service, lower profits. So let's hear a so. less depressing story. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So Kim, uh, Quick Trip has often been rated one of the top places to work, to work in the country, uh, yet it's a very successful, highly profitable company. Can you give us an overview of Quick Trip and talk a little about it's workforce and workforce philosophy. Sure, absolutely, and thank you. Um, it is fun to be able to talk about Quick Trip. And uh, we are a convenience store gasoline marketer. We're in about 13 states. We sell about 1.5% of all the gasoline sold in the United States out of 610, 615 stores. We are growing. Uh, and building about, we'll have about 50 new stores this year, so we're adding quite a few jobs in the Carolinas market. And we have currently about 13,000 employees, so we're, we're fairly large. Our employees, most of them have some college. They come to work for us a lot of times as a part-timer and move into full-time. Um, we have, for our shifts, we have a full-time person on duty at all times and we call them an, assist an assistant manager. So we have an assistant manager and then they're uh, filled depending on the number of uh, sales that we had and transactions, actually we break it down to transactions, the week before will be filled in with part-time help, okay? One of the things that um, we do is 100% promotion from within, okay? So you start at Quick Trip as an IDE assistant and you move up to a second assistant, a first assistant, a store manager, all right? We do not ever hire anyone into a manager training program, okay? So you start with us kind of at the bottom. And we all, uh, all of us have that story, uh, vice president levels, sans our petroleum trader uh, and, and the, the VP in charge of that, and our CFO, no, I'm sorry, she is still a, a she started out as a mail clerk for us. So even in the corporate office, we promote from within. We believe in giving people opportunity. We have half of our programming staff, and we probably have 130, half of our programming staff started out in the stores, okay? So we're given opportunity across the board. Uh, real estate managers, 100% of our real estate managers who buy our properties for us came from the stores, or uh, we have an HR secretary who moved up, and she is now a, a real estate manager in Atlanta. So giving employees that opportunity gives them something. We believe retail can be a career, all right? And even at the store level, we have a lot of 30-year store managers working for us. We've been in business 52 years. Um, when you look at our 20-year and above, we, it's just amazing how many 20-year store managers we have working at our stores. But we know that's a benefit. I think what some of the retailers feel, it, it is very short-term thinking. These people are going to leave anyway. So why do I invest this time in them? They're going to leave anyway. Well, we, very much like the container store, do a one-on-one -on -one training with you for two weeks when you come to work for us. And then if a person needs a third week, we invest a third week of that one-on-one -on -one training. So you have an, a natural mentor when you come to work for Quick Trip and you go to work on that first night shift and you're going, oh my gosh, there's so many people coming through because we do have a lot of transactions. You've got someone, you know, that you can talk to the next day. So I think that's important to have someone like that. For us, we start, our starting salary is thirty-five uh, dollars to $36,000 a year for the night person coming in to run our convenience store shift. Okay, very high compared to the convenience store industry. I will tell you the convenience store industry, the margin is one and a half percent profit margin to two percent, okay? But at Quick Trip, we have about $10 billion in sales a year. So we pay very well 
And I think having great employees is what generates our sales. So it's very short-term thinking for other retailers who just, okay, they're going to be leaving anyway. I'm not going to invest any time in them. I'm just going to hire someone who can run that register after four hours of training. Well, that's not true. We want someone who can give you great customer service. We share in the profit of the store with every store employee, okay? Uh, Part-timers, after they've been with us a year, get a store bonus based on the profitability of the store. And it makes up 10% of their salary, okay, the store bonus. So it's not $100. It's not $300. It easily can be $2,000, okay, for a store manager. Then we have a measure for customer service where we look each week at 43 different items. Is your cherry, diet, vanilla, Dr. Pepper in stock? You know, we want to make sure we're measuring, giving the customer what they want. And what do you want? You want it clean if you touch it, right? You want it to be there if you're going in for a specific product. You want that product to be working and to be available. And you want to get in and out very quickly, right? So we have a standard where if there's three people in line, another worker has to come up and start running a register. The other cool thing that we do, you don't have a register that you have to change your money out. Every employee can work out of all four registers, and it's that team that's held accountable for the cash audit. Very different in, than yeah. retail. And people tell us we're crazy, that you're nuts. We have the lowest cash shrinkage in the convenience store industry. Our cash audits are the best, and inventory shrink. Okay. So it's a mix of everything. Right? And your people can do numbers in their heads. And our people can do numbers in their heads. <laughs> Who would have thought? Right. Speak, like, speaking we have great employees. <laughs> so, speaking of numbers, uh, you know, one of the main focuses today is how to improve the lot, the lives of retail workers. And it's often said the more education, you know, American workers need more education to increase their productivity, increase their earnings potential. So I wanted to ask you, Zainab, you know, what are the returns of education in retail if someone gets community college, college education, does it help them a lot in, in retail? Uh, what education should retail workers get? What jobs does it lead to? So I haven't really seen scholarly research on the benefits of education in the retail industry. Um, but let me just step back and, and, and look at education in the big scheme of things. Because for education, I think first we have to ask, what are retail employees asked to do? Right? So, so what would they be educating for? And, and I just, um, Henry Ford, you know, the father of mass production in the auto industry um, in the early 19, you know, many, many decades ago. He has one saying, and, and, and which resonated in the mass production system for a long, long time. And, and, and this famous quote is, why when I only want to hire a pair of hands, do I get the whole person? So Ford, and, and, and he was right, because when you looked at the, you know, you talked about manufacturing as, as being, this country being an industrial country and, 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 and having manufacturing jobs being very important. Um, mass production, you looked at the job itself and it was, you know, narrow jobs and people would perform the same task over and over and they really didn't used to use their heads. So who cares about how much education they have? Um, but then what we saw in that industry, so, so, so the attitude toward work and, and, and workers itself changed tremendously in the manufacturing industry. We learned from companies like Toyota that it's actually great to involve your employees in the design of processes and, and, and process improvements. It's great benefits to the company if you enable your workers to have pride and dignity in what they do. Um, unfortunately, when you look at retail right now, put, you know, Quick Trip is one of the, you know, it's actually one of the few examples, especially in the low-cost retail. But when you look at retail in general, um, it resembles more like the mass production system of early 1900s than, than um, the Toyota production system that, that we talk about right now. And, and that's unfortunate. So most of the tasks are designed, more, most of the decisions are made at the corporate, and retail employees are asked to execute without making any judgment, without making any decisions, and without being empowered. So, so if your whole job is just to perform narrow tasks, then education will not help you um, get anywhere. So, so I think before we think about education and training, we really have to look at the work itself and redesign the work itself so that it is, you know, it is worth to, to, to educate employees and, and train them. Carrie, what are you seeing in, in New York City where you're based about the education levels that 
uh, retail workers have there, and what do you recommend that they do regarding education? Um, well, we just did a major survey of New York City retail workers uh, working at major employers. So we surveyed workers working at national retailers. It was uh, the report some of you have, the discounted jobs, how retailers are selling workers short. And it was done by Naoki Fujita, who's here today, and also uh, Professor Stephanie Luce. And what we found uh, was really interesting. 70% of the workers that we surveyed had at least some college. 35% had a college degree. Um, similarly, 37% had not yet graduated from college. And so what we see in our membership at the Retail Action Project is that workers want an education. They're trying to do it. They're juggling their jobs, as, as Steve had said, and that the barriers are, it's too hard to, to work a retail job with the crazy schedules and also get a degree. Um, but what we're also finding is that many of our members are getting college, have college degrees, have master's degrees, but the companies aren't offering them the opportunities for advancement. Uh, Uniqlo is a major retailer that's growing. They hired 1,000 part-time workers, FIT graduates who would be a tremendous asset to the company. But the, uh, the ability to advance within the company is just the, co the competition is way too tough. And so what they're doing is they're hiring similarly college graduates for management. And so we're seeing fewer opportunities for people to grow from within the companies. And, and that's what we're trying to do um, in terms of being able to, wh what we do at, at the Retail Action Project is a lot of workforce development work that's really catered to help people uh, access the opportunities that do exist in the industry. And so sometimes it means leaving your growing retailer and moving on to another retailer. Um, we use professional networking. I know people oftentimes think of, well, that's for white collar workers. Well, in retail, um, most of our members get their jobs and advance in the industry because they've met somebody else in the industry. Uh, when, when Uniqlo opened up in Soho, it was the H&M manager who was hired there and brought all of their best people. And so uh, we, do a lot of, we do a lot of training. And our trainers are people who are from the industry, who have careers in the industry, and can model that to the associates. Because I've seen workers who are on a career path but still have it in their head that it's, that it's dead end, that there's not opportunity, and actually walk away from opportunities because they haven't been given the training to navigate the bumps in the road. Retail is a stressful job. It's regimented, multitasking job with very high levels of customer service that people have really had to develop on their own. And so what we offer is advanced sales skills. Uh, we offer uh, customer service training from the most basic levels to, to advancement so that um, members will come to us as they move through the industry um, and we're able to, to help them grow at every step of the way. Um, we've also been able to um, really cultivate a hiring network with employers so that uh, managers who are experiencing this turnover because the corporate doesn't get credit the training programs to keep people and, um, and that we're able to offer skilled workers to, to the retail workforce. Um, and also then able to navigate and manage uh, situations when, when there's bumps in the road. So Kim, uh, what is Quick Trip's uh, view on education? Does it want a lot of people with college degrees? Does it, uh, I know it does a lot of training on the job, but it, does it also subsidize for people to go to school? We do, and it's very interesting is, is that we have a lot of people who come to work for us because uh, we offer a tuition reimbursement program, so while they're going to college. One of the other things that we do is you have a set schedule for the year or maybe three years, okay? So if you're a night assistant, you know every schedule you're going to work. There, it's not, you don't know from day to day. You know from year to year until we make a decision to change that schedule. And when we do make that decision, we use a panel of a resource group of employees from every division that we have and there's typically a resource group will have six to eight people on it and so from each one of our divisions that's who we look to to see if we decide we're going to implement change in something that would affect an employee but our tuition reimbursement program we offer it uh, two different programs one is we will pay up to four thousand dollars for a degree uh, or towards an undergraduate degree for anyone who's working after 11 o'clock at night and it's for any degree, okay? Because this, we need great night assistance. We think people who have that education 
can make those decisions, can run a business professionally, and having college is a big benefit for that. If you're, and we did that a few years ago because we were struggling getting our quality of night people that we were wanting. So that's why we implemented that. The following year, we implemented same $4,000 if you are going to towards a business degree. And that's for anyone. That's for anyone in our corporate office, our warehouses, our commissary, or the stores. And one of the interesting things that we have is for part-timers. They too can participate in the same program, the same tuition reimbursement program, and we make it so that um, they have to work 20 hours during the year uh, on average through the school month. Summer, because our business is seasonal, we, our sales go way up, we need a lot more part-time work in the summertime, we want them to work at least 36 hours a week in the summer. That helped us to keep from having to, you know, uh, rehire them back each summer. They stay on. Uh, we have some programs where they can go away to a school and come back and be right back in the same program and participate in this tuition reimbursement program. Um, I, I think it's pretty innovative. It has really helped us with uh, leveling our part-time, you know, that seasonal worker coming back and forth from school. And it just makes sense for us to participate, and that's one of the benefits that we do offer. So, we, so you just talked about education in terms of going to school, mm -hmm. but you say that you've talked, you've written a lot about the importance of cross training, which is really uh, learning on the job. And you know, a lot of worker retail workers complain that they're not given enough hours; they're only given 15 or 20 hours. And you know, some employers say, well. If you're trained not just as a cashier, but know how to run the shoe department or the hardware department, you know, we could give you more, more hours and you could work longer. Can you talk a little about the importance yeah. of cross-training? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I've studied, um, l let me just um, backtrack a little bit. I, I've studied four low-cost retailers, including Quick Trip, that offer good jobs and make more money than their competitors and, and lowest prices at the same time. And, and, and what I found when I looked at these retailers was that they didn't just invest in their employees and just let it happen. They made specific operational decisions that allow them to have very productive employees, that allow them to have lower cost, and that allow them to have, uh, to have employees in the center of their su success. And cross-training is one of these decisions. So when you look at retail, uh, traffic into the store varies greatly, right? Sometimes you have a lot of customers, sometimes you have a few customers. And, and a lot of retailers try to match their labor supply with that traffic. So what does that mean when they try to do a close match? That means that you know, the, 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 the stuff that you uh, carry, and, and Steve talked about employee schedules, change all the time because they have, again, company things, they execute, they have narrow jobs. If they are at, at the cashier, they just you know, perform that job. If they're stocking, they're just stocking. So they're very specialized. So when, when you know, they're, you know, and, and their shifts work with, um, with traffic, but when you look at companies like Quick Trip, companies like Mercadona of Spain, uh, Trader Joe's, some of you might know about Trader Joe's or Costco, they cross-train their employees. So they don't change the number of hours all that much, uh, as much as the other retailers, but they change what employees do. So when customers are there, they perform customer service related tasks. So they'll work at the cash registers. The same Quick Trip employee could be working at the cash register, could be cleaning the toilets, could be ordering merchandise. So, so when the customer is there, you do customer service tasks. When the customer is not there, you do back office, the boring operational uh, tasks. So, so cross-training really allows you to, to, to um, end up doing something that's good for the employee, good for the customer, and also good for profits. So we've talked a lot about how things affect impact workers. Can we talk a little about how things affect the retailers themselves? And do you, Zainab, do you think uh, it really helps retailers to rely primarily on you know, low-wage workers who aren't trained very much? I know you've studied Walmart, you've studied Costco, you've studied a lot of, a lot of companies. Is there a trade-off between job quality and, and, and making profits? <laughs> Depends on who you talk to, right? <laughs> uh, so if you talk, so, so, so the conventional wisdom in this, I, I used to always say, you know, I, I would be, I, I had interviewed all the retail workers and I would give examples of companies like Container Store, Wegmans, who have great employee practices and people would tell me, executives would tell me, oh, but they charge higher prices. 
That's why they can afford to invest in their labor. Uh, so then I said, okay, let me look at low-cost retailing. And the conventional wisdom in low-cost retailing is that bad jobs are necessary, uh, are necessary to succeed. Uh, if the jobs are not bad, if you mess more in your employees, then your customers will have to pay with higher prices. When you talk to Walmart executives, when they're asked you know, about how bad their jobs are, their answer you know, is very carefully worded, but their answer oftentimes goes like this, oh, we need to run a really efficient operation. So controlling costs is really important because customers come to us for, um, for the low prices. So it all suggests that if they were to invest more in their labor, um, then prices would have to increase. And it's not just Walmart. Even people who write about Walmart, even the critics of Walmart say they have a lot of profits they could share with the employees. Or you know, they suggest that investing in employees would, would either reduce Walmart's profits or, or prices for customers. But I, I found in my research that there is absolutely no trade-off between low prices and good jobs. I've studied four successful retailers, including QuickTrip, that offer the lowest prices and, 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 and offer good jobs and, and um, make a lot more money. If you look at QuickTrip in 2010, they made 89% 89% higher profits than the top quartile in their industry. So not just their star, star, not not just the average, but the top quartile in the industry. So so performs greatly. So so let me just tell you about another retailer and and their practices. This is Mercadona of Spain. They're they're the largest supermarket chain in Spain. Um, they have over 1,200 stores. They employ more than 60,000 people, and 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 they offer good jobs to these people. And what do good jobs mean? They mean you know higher wages than than their competitors. And good jobs mean lots of other things. One, their employees receive, uh, each new employee receives four weeks of training. 5,000 euro is spent on each new employee at Mercadona. And during the first week, they learn about all the tasks. They're cross-trained, so they can do multiple tasks. And then the, the next three weeks are, you know, they're paired with the best person in, the, in, in, in their area about, you know, if they're going to be in the butcher department or in the vegetables and fruit section, you know, they, 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 they are matched with the best person in that area and do one-on-one -on -one training much like you do. Um, so apart from training and higher wages, they also have stable schedules. So at Mercadona, again, 62,000 employees, 100% of them are permanent employees. More than 85% of them are full-timers. And full time here in this country often doesn't mean 40 hours of work, right? Because more than 90% of retailers consider anyone who works more than 30 hours to be a full timer. So even if you're a full timer, you're, you're, you're paying very greatly from week to week. While McDonald's full timers are not hourly employees, they're salaried. And they have four chefs, and they on average work 6.6 .6 hours a day, and they learn about their chefs one month in advance. So, so offers you know great benefits to, to their employees, and then you look at you know their customer service is much better than their competitors. Their prices are consistently lower than their, their competitors, and then you say, how about their investors? Do they make less money? Actually, they make more money than their competitors. Their profit margins are higher. Their inventory turnover is higher. Their shrink is lower. Whatever performance measure you look at, Mercadona performs better. And, and this is a model that works for employees, it works for customers, and it works for investors all at the same time, just like uh, Trader Joe's, just like Quick Trip, just like Costco. And what I found in my research, which is great for somebody who studies operations, is that you know, these retailers, as I mentioned, don't just invest in their employees and let everything happen. Um, they make specific operational decisions that break the trade-off between low prices and, and good jobs. So, and these operational decisions, you know, if, if I had an hour, I would go through each one of them, <laughs> like, like cross-training. But, but each of the operating decisions that they make are very different than what their competitors make, and they work great as, as a system. So, so there's hope. I remember when I interviewed you once, you said, you know, there are two ways for retailers to make money. Yeah. They, money. they could take the high-road strategy, you know, pay the employees well, have a lot of employees to, to ensure good service, so the employees are happy, the customers are happy, a lot of sales per employee and the company can be profitable that way, a container store or Costco. Then you said there are other companies that can make plenty of money by not having enough employees, by not providing yep. very good customer service. Maybe they have low prices uh, and the customers will grumble, the employees will grumble, but the companies will still make money. So Kim, uh, so uh, we keep saying Quick Trip is a model uh, in, in, in human resources uh, philosophy. What uh, advice do you give other companies and what do you tell you know, the companies that say, oh, you know, 
we're really skeptical of that. We don't think it's worth paying anyone fifteen, eighteen dollars an hour. You know, is there a good business case for for their view? For their view, <laughs> <laughs> I, again, I think it's because um, it's very short-term thinking, and the only cost that they are attributing to turnover is training costs. Whereas you said, customer satisfaction, we have increased sales. We have people who come to our store, they tell us four times a day, you know, and they want to see their employee. You know, they want to see you, Matt. You hire very attractive Mark. cashiers. So no. <laughs> <laughs> but they're going to come into um, uh, our stores, and I think it is because of what we do for our employees. And so there's the business case. It, better customer satisfaction, they're spending more money with us. Volume, we are obviously at a one and a half percent margin. It's all about volume, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, we could make a lot more money, but we think that would be in a very short term. It wouldn't last us. We'd become just like some of the other retailers who are just, you know, getting, getting by. And what I tell our VP of operations is we make a lot of people wealthy. And so it's not just your higher ups. We have, um, we're privately held and we have an ESOP, so our employees actually own part of the company, about 12% of the company. And we have a lot, a lot of our store employees who are millionaires in their retirement plan and in their ESOP, all right? It is amazing. We know that buys uh, very loyal employees. We treat them well. They take care of us, okay? And um, not everyone's millionaire, but some of those 20-year <laughs> managers absolutely are, all right? And who would think you would say that being a convenience store manager? So I absolutely think there is a case. If someone will, would listen, you can make more money and provide for more of your employees. And fortunately, we, our founder, that's what he wanted to do. He didn't want to sell our company when he was offered by a major oil company because it wouldn't be good for the employees. He knew they would change our, our salary structure, do away with our corporate, most of our corporate departments, and he turned down probably more money than I could not because it would not be good for the employees. So, Carrie, can you talk a little bit about what the Retail Action Project is doing in terms of working with employers, retailers to improve job quality, and what are you doing to and make the case to them that they should be following the high road. Yeah, a lot of what we do is, is a lot of policy research in terms of what are the best practices. Because I think that a lot of the research that Zainab Tan is doing and other researchers is new. And so it's not, I mean, the profitability case on best practices um, is still being made. And so what we try to do is promote um, and publicize good research so that employers do have the tools to be able to implement them in, in, on the sales floor. Uh, we also try to work directly with managers um, through our hiring network because a lot of them, in spite of the fact that you know, corporate um, retailers are increasingly centralizing their corporate operations, the managers are really having to implement this on the, on the front line. And so they make a lot of scheduling decisions and we can talk to them about how considering workers' requests and managing, uh, considering the, the work-life balances of, of their workforce is actually going to make their life easier because they're not going to see as much turnover um, and that, that will ultimately help them with their labor costs um, because they're going to see their, their profitability up. We're able to kind of implement the, the virtuous cycle that Zainab Tan is talking about, working directly with store managers. Um, in terms of, you know, and I, I still think, you know, in terms of the overall retail industry, it's, it's unfortunate that um, the, the, the case that good jobs are good for retailers isn't just becoming a, a natural trend. It's really a select few retailers that are really making this a part of their business model. Uh, we, we see other retailers that where workers have unionized um, with the, the RWDSU and the UFCW and were able to negotiate those contracts um, at the RWDSU and UFCW, you know, we've been able to, to offer policy solutions that they've been able to then bargain for. Uh, at the Macy's Bloomingdale's contract, they were able to really implement the flex time scheduling practices uh, so that gave the workers the ability to, to select stable shifts and have six months advance notice of their schedule, which is really becoming a rarity in the retail industry. And so 
through coordination with them, we're able to say, look, this is what we're seeing in terms of the solutions. This is something that might be worth bargaining for. But in, in terms of the overall level, I mean, what we're also trying to do is only, you know, 5% of the retail workforce is unionized. That's, you know, out of 15 million workers. And so what we're trying to do is really build a, a stronger, wider membership network of retail workers so that they can begin to create the change and create the jobs that they need to see. Um, you know, it's not just about what we try to do in our workforce development. Well, you get the job and then you're in good. Well, unfortunately, people are getting jobs and then they're seeing their benefits taken away or their hours cut. And so what we try to do is really also as advocates and organizers to say, well, like these are some strategies to, to, to you know, hold your, your employer um, accountable to having the better practices because so many of them are making these short-term um, decisions and, and it's really putting the cost of doing business on working people. There was an article in Forbes which cited our research that talked about how single moms are getting hit hardest. Um, we found in our research that, that parents are really the ones that are most vulnerable to these flexible schedules. I've seen one of our members, she had a you know, young single mom, had a great job at Ann Taylor, but because she got too short notice of her shift, she quit her job. And it was a job that we were able to get her through our workforce development. So if we don't deal with what's happening on the sales floor as well and really try to advance those practices, uh, we're going we're gonna to continue to see the challenges in terms of helping people obtain employment. Um, in terms of, you know, I think overall though, um, you know, in terms of how we're working with retailers, it's definitely, uh, it's something that we're still paving away. I think in New York City, we're starting to deban expand our employer network. We're trying to partner more with retailers like Eileen Fisher to really show that there's smaller re retailers out there like Eileen Fisher and like Quick Trip and that um, more should follow suit. Thank you. So in an era where some people seem to want to get rid of government altogether, <laughs> certainly get rid of government <laughs> regulation, okay. uh, I wanted to ask, uh, start with you, uh, Zainab. What, if anything, do you, do you think the government, those goddamn regulators should do or could do to improve things uh, in terms of job quality for retail workers? Steve, I'm just an operations gal. <laughs> you know, I'm sure people in this audience will have much better policy okay. recommendations. Well, I'm sure that, Carrie, that, I'm sure that, Carrie that will be happy but to let, address But let me okay. uh, take another, another perspective. I think we all need to do our share to inspire more and to educate more. Because for too long, again, I'll take the business side of things. For too long, businesses have focused, and, and, and business academics as well, focused on very narrowly defined objectives. So in my field, operations management, we have profit maximization as pretty much the sole objective when we teach our students about how to make decisions, um, simple decisions like optimizing inventory levels. And my, my colleagues in other fields have you know, shareholder value um, maximization as the sole objective of, of a firm. So, so when you have these very narrow objectives, firms end up doing things that hurt their workers, hurt their customers, and hurt their bottom line in the long term, and hurt the competitiveness of our country. So I think we really need to revisit our, what, what, what is the purpose of a firm, firm, what is the objective of a firm, and, 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 and the, the successful companies that I've worked with, um, specifically and explicitly prioritize employees and customers ahead of investors. So when you look at Costco, customers come first, employees come second, suppliers come third, investors come last. When you look at Mercadona, again, customers come first, employees come second, suppliers come third, society comes fourth, and then and investors come, come last. Well, you know, are these companies, you know, socialist enterprises? No, they exist to make money and they make more money. So why do they do, why do they put their investors as the last? Because it's just too easy and too tempting to cut on labor spending. Uh, so, so providing these constraints allow them to stick to their values, stick to their businesses, and, 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 and continue that for, for the long term. So, so I think, you know, wouldn't it be great if our political leaders and policy <laughs> um, people inspired more business people to lead companies like Costco or Mercadona or, or, or Quick Trip? 
wouldn't it be great if at business schools we teach our students how to get there, how to ins you know inspire our students to create those companies and, and, and teach them you know how to get there? We unfortunately don't do enough of that right now. I've taught at both Harvard Business School and at MIT Sloan School of Management, and I teach second year courses. So our students come for two years, and, and they meet me uh, usually in, in their last semester um, before they graduate. And here, and at the end of each semester, we ask our students to do evaluations for classes. And here's a comment that I repeatedly get from students, which actually breaks my heart. You know, they say, this is the only course at HBS or at MIT Sloan where I saw that it was possible to create good jobs and a lot of profits at the same time. And this is the only course where I saw, you know, how to make that happen. We need more courses like this. We need to educate our students to do more of this. And and I am, you know, I started very in a very depressing way. I'll, I'll <laughs> end in a, <laughs> as we said, I'll, I'll end in a more optimistic way. But I think more people are realizing this at MIT Sloan, particular. You know, we have great academics who who are working on on these issues. And even you know, economists like Michael Porter, uh, who is a very you know leading economist in this country, who now states that he urges the companies to put the you know, um, interest of the society as well as the investors. And he, he, he says that the purpose of a company to maximize, you know, the shared value, not just shareholders' value. So I'm optimistic. But I think we all need to do our part to inspire and to educate. And Kim, what do you think the government can do to help uh, Quick Trip, to help improve job quality there? Well, for us, it is the expansion of regulatory uh, changes that are, you know, make it really harder for us to do business. And I think it is the focus. It just takes that focus away and trying to figure out what are we going to do when we provide you know, great benefits. If I'm talking about the Affordable Medical Care Act, um, we're providing great benefits. I know, and, and Carrie, you stated it, we're paying for everyone who's uninsured already, right? Mm -hmm. It's got to come from somewhere. And so to have to jump through the hoops and try to figure out what's going on with all this expansion takes away from, from us. And so that's, that's one of the things that, of course, we would love to see less of. Absolutely, everybody else needs to be inspired to do what the things that the Costco folks are doing and then try to put into place. If we can just get them past that, oh, it's going to cost too much. We have hundreds of retailers call me I, just all the time. Can, can we come and look at your training? Can we come and look at your model? Can we come and look at you? And we're, yes, absolutely. Absolutely, we want to raise the level of the convenience store industry, and every one of them walk away going, "Oh, we could never afford to do this." So, you know. So, Carrie, well, before we take questions, so a one-minute answer. So, what what do you recommend that the uh, government do to help uh, lift low-wage retail workers? Well, I think elevating the minimum wage is a good start. An index to inflation. Um, it's, it's far out of bounds and it's, it's been too long and people aren't um, able to earn enough to spend enough and so in tax retail. Um, the, other, the other policy solution that we're working hard to advance is stop, um, is, is getting policies in place that don't incentivize part-time work. Um, all of our social safety net is really for full-time workers and so part-time workers are excluded from basic benefits like FMLA, um, unemployment insurance and even the Affordable Care Act actually encourages retailers to schedule people for for 30 hours um, because or less than 30 hours um, and so we're really trying to make sure that policies that we're implementing policies that acknowledge the, the growth of the part-time workforce but then also we're trying to take on the unpredictable scheduling so these unpaid call-in shifts are a big issue workers are waiting to work at home. They're disciplined if they're not available, but they're not getting paid for it. And so we're really working on developing uh, dynamic policy solutions to really take this on. Um, and, and this impacts everything about a worker's ability to advance. And now the moment you've all been waiting for. Now we'll take <laughs> uh, questions from the audience. Is there a microphone? There is a microphone. Okay. okay. Um, someone back, back there? Oh, you're the microphone. Okay, this gentleman, sorry. Okay. So they're 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 recording it on video. So. Hello, hello. Uh, Ron Hopkins, Aussie Trust. So, um, what is the industry feeling about a national retail credential? I don't know. 
Well, yeah, I think that there's. You want to talk about the fog test? <laughs> 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 Carrie. Sure. I mean, I think that you can look to, to countries like Germany, other parts of the world where there is a national retail credential, and that's where there's a lot of cross-training part-time workers do the full level of, of retail operations on the sales floor. And so I think that credentialing retail skills is key. And, and, and we, we have credentials. We have actually a local college uh, credentials, our customer service class. And that is the training that people are clamoring to come because they have these skills that are not valued in the industry. And so if we can put value on the skills through credentials, I think we'll see a lot more people becoming serious about careers in retail. And we're gonna see retailers more serious about their workforce. Um, they're not gonna do the, the fog test right. as, <laughs> as, as Kim. I was, was telling a story at lunch of, <laughs> of another convenience store retailer to be unnamed, <laughs> told me that that's how they hired. And I will tell you, Typically, if, they, if, they, if you leave they, fog, if you breathe and leave fog mirror, on a mirror, yes. If you leave fog on a mirror, they hire you. Okay. <laughs> now, at Quick Trip, we uh, hire centrally. All right. So we have personnel managers and four or five people who hire. So we have a set group that's hiring the employee that we know is going to work great at Quick Trip. Most retailers, the manager hires, and so the fog test is appropriate because they're going to have to work that shift if they don't get someone hired to fill it. And so there's, I think there needs to be something more added uh, for, if it's credentialing, mm -hmm. on how to hire the right employee and not just to settle for someone who it can fill in that shift that day. And, and I think that may be a, a great idea. I do wanna say for us, we learned, and I guess it was 1996, we did a re-engineering project where we were really just trying to understand how long it took to do everything in the stores. And we learned our part-time clerks serviced 70% of the transactions. So that's who we wanted training for, to get in front of our, employ our customers and provide great customer service for them and put them on the customer service bonus. It just makes sense. Uh, and I think a lot of retailers may not really fully understand who's waiting on their customer and who is representing their company there. The gentleman okay. along the window. I had to smile uh, when I heard about the slim profit margins for Walmart. I think they just opened a new art museum costing hundreds of millions of dollars you know, with all the art, which leads me to the question about excessive executive compensation. I believe some companies like uh, Whole Foods um, have a specific formula on what multiple the top executive and the lowest employee has. And I believe in Asia and Europe, the disparity between executives and employees is far, far narrower. Only in America, you know, when people complain about the greed of executives, it, do you see that huge disparity? Would you comment any? <laughs> I'll comment on, on what I know from, yeah. from uh, compensation studies, and you're absolutely right. There are a lot yeah. of CEOs who pay themselves a lot, and we talk about how the all ships uh, rise with the tide, and so as these increase, and a comp committee is comparing compensation for a CEO, well, they have to increase theirs to match. You know, it's, it's a matching game. And we don't do that necessarily at the, at the entry level, okay? Yeah. For us, our pay philosophy for our entry level is that we will pay whatever it takes to get the quality of employee who starts as, not, as a night assistant that can turn into a store manager, that can turn into a VP of operations, whatever it takes, because we know we have to bring them in there to get them to where we need them five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Yeah, and, and you're right. I mean, the disparity is in the numbers, in the aggregate numbers, and, and specific examples. One of my favorite examples is what happened to Home Depot um, in, at the end of uh, 1999 when the retailer was about a 50 billion, you know, close to a 50 billion dollar retailer. They realized that they needed more, you know, new methods to, to get to the next 50 billion dollars, and they hired a GE executive, uh, Bob Nardelli, to lead the change. And the thing is, it's a matching game. So it's supply and demand. So, so at the time, you know, GE had just, Jack Walsh had just retired. So Jeff Immelt became the CEO of GE. And there were two other contenders. One of them went to 3M and the other went to Home Depot. I think Bob Nardelli made somewhere around $50 million. Um, 
during his tenure there, the stock price did not move during his tenure, mm -hmm. and 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 it's uh, and, and and the types of decisions that that he made during this time were very detrimental to the employees. Um, and for the customers, and at, at the end for the stock price as well. So, so, so it is a problem. Yeah, if I may just um, add, I, I I did a big story about Costco, and and uh, I, I interviewed Jim Senegal, the founder, one of the co-founders, and uh, Costco is a phenomenal success, right? And the average worker probably makes forty thousand, maybe a little more there. And I think Senegal, if my memory serves, I think limited his salary to one point two million, which sounds like a lot of money, but it's probably one tenth of what the Walmart CEO makes. So the ratio of 1.2 million to 40,000, like 30 to 1, which by American standards almost sounds European or Japanese. Uh, <laughs> but you know, the typical CEO is making 300, 350,000. And I remember asking Senegal, you know, why, I, why do you agree to such low pay? He says, you know, I'm very wealthy thanks to all the stock I have, but it sends an important symbol to my employees that you know, I'm not trying to be greedy. Uh, Actually, Alan Wurzel just left, and he was CEO of Circuit City. I think he ran out of here when you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, he should have stayed because um, a lot of us in this room worked on um, credentials and identifying the national skill standards for the retail industry for a long time. And the beauty of that was that people like Alan sat down at the table with competitors in the name of identifying cross industry Can you identify skills. yourself? I'm just curious I'm who you sorry, are I'm since Kathy you sound Manis so knowledgeable. And, uh, and I um, worked with National Retail Federation on this mm -hmm. for about 15 years. Um, and what we learned, and, and others, Goodwill and others that are here worked on that too, and that's why we're all back, because we're so happy you're talking about retail again. Um, what We learned two things. One is, if you're going to look at um, skill sets and credentials, let's look at them in the name of customer service and sales, which are cross-industry skills. So I think one of the points we haven't made here that's very important is retail is a training ground for cross-industry skills that are valuable in a variety of industries. And that's a, a really good argument to make mm -hmm. for an introductory job. Um, and secondly, I think the argument has to be made to the point that you just referenced. We did have companies, including Home Depot, that made it a preferred qualification for hire. And particularly in a time now where we're looking for opportunities for special populations, veterans, disabled, older workers, it's a way to level the playing ground if we do agree on what are the skill sets, what are the opportunities, what are the credentials. So um, I think we need to look at retail as a training ground as well as a career path opportunity. And um, just thank you very much for, for raising this today. Thank you. Any other questions in back? I'm Peter Shires from the International Youth Foundation, and we do exactly this kind of work internationally, not in the U.S., and we work with a number of different re retailers. Um, I just wanted to emphasize um, what you were talking about in terms of the evidence base, because this is something we continuously confront of the need to be able to make the case to companies that we're working with that the investment in training really pays off. It pays off in terms of reduced recruitment costs, increased productivity, um, and so to the extent that that is there, uh, we're trying to develop it in our programs, but uh, we'd love to know more about what's available. Um, my question is related to the, the, the last comment that was made. We also do find, particularly with young employees, that it is a first job for many, and they go on to other jobs, and it's not intended for them to be a career, but it is a good training ground. I just wonder also what evidence there exists on that, particularly for those uh, retailers that aren't making the kind of investments in training but for whom this does provide uh, almost kind of like an on-the-job training for for young employees I mean I'll, I'll, I'll take the training issue um, not the you know transient employees that move on to other careers but I think again once again we have to ask what are we training them for we have to we have to look at the work itself and reinvent the work itself before we think about um, the training of the retail employees. Is is is, is and, I, and I think um, just like Quick Trip, you know, training alone or 
Invest, you know, paying your employees alone will not get you anywhere if you don't change the work itself. Mm -hmm. That's the that that's the you know that's what I have seen. Right. Looking at the four retailers that 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 are very successful in terms of investing in their employees and making money and and providing low prices, it's a system that works together. It's not just one element. You can't just you know increase price, increase the wage of the employee and expect great performance. You can't just invest in your employee, you know, in, in employee training and expect great performance. So you have to do a bunch of things all at the same time to be able to get there. So I think we need to look at the entire, you know, the whole picture rather than just, just one component. And absolutely, it's communicating with your employees. It's really what we do the best at Quick Trip, holding them accountable, setting that expectation, holding them accountable, training them how to do it, training them how to care for their people that are working in the store with them, a very team-oriented. Uh, there is very much more to it than just training. It is a lot, the experience, it's listening to their ideas. And I will tell you, we listen to their ideas every year. They have a chance to sit with the CEO, every employee, once a year, and say, here's what's wrong. Here's what needs to change. And we tell them, OK, we'll find an answer for that, or no, we're not going to do that. And if we're going to find out an answer, here's when we'll do it. And we have to live by what we tell them. And, and put, putting your money where your mouth is, doing what you say you're going to do, that is what we need to to do as employers and just make it a better experience, a better opportunity, and not just a stop-off place to learn how to run a cash register. Thanks. Uh, I'm Jill Cashin with the United Food and Commercial Workers uh, International Union. We represent grocery retail workers. I was curious if you could speak a little bit about technology in the workplace. And we have a just ongoing transition to self-checkout, to trans changing what could be a good job that puts someone on a career path, thinking that human beings can be easily replaced with an iPad or a self-checkout machine. I'd really like some kind of reflection on just like what a bad idea that is. Yeah, I you agree. agree. I, 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 didn't, I can didn't, never get Didn't the head of JC Penney just say yeah. they're going to get rid of all uh, cash registers and, and yeah. go to all self-checkout? <laughs> yeah, so JC Penny also said that they're going to invest in RFID um, in apparel, which probably makes sense. RFID is one of the technologies that, that, that was supposed to make um, people, cashiers, obsolete. I started studying RFID, um, I think, about 10 years ago. And this is just, uh, let me just take one of the technologies and, and where it went. And, and, and we, that I'm sure there will be some technologies that will be implemented and that will replace some of the workers. It's just reality. We have to go with, with, with the pace. But, but, but let me talk about that one in particular. You know, you know what RFID is? It's the radio frequency identification tags that will supposedly replace barcodes. So, so, um, so supposedly, you go to a supermarket, all the items that you buy will be in your shopping cart, and then you'll go through the checkout, and everything will be scanned automatically because they, they have the RFID tags, and that will be an RFID reader, and you'll go through this, um, this amazing experience. So was told to and me get, and, get a, and get ago. irradiated. Yeah. So, yeah. so 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 when I was uh, working about stocking issues at the retail stores, uh, some you know a, a person who who uh, I won't name his name, but he was a big proponent of RFID, and he said we don't have it yet, but it will happen in ten years. So then I said, okay, I tried to write a case about RFID. I went to Germany. I work with Metro Group. It's a large retailer. It's one of the world, world's largest retailers. And I wrote a case about RFID with them. And, and again, I meet with their IT head. And, and he says, this technology will happen, but it, it will be uh, 10 years from now. <laughs> and now I'm reading reports about RFID. And, and it seems like the only thing that's in, you know, constant about this tech now, this particular technology is that it will happen in 10 years from now. <laughs> um, but there will be, you know, self-checkout has been used in other forms at other retailers, and there are some technologies that might improve the productivity of employees, and, and, and I think um, we have to think about how we're going to um, have our employees use their heads, not just their hands, and, 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 and think about you know, what can technology not do and our employees can do and, and, and really focus on that because we can't prevent some of the things from happening. L last question. Okay. Did, did you have a Okay. Yes. Um, Maureen, we should stop, right? So just from a research standpoint, I'm curious to know about the difference um, 
in companies that treat employees well, have good profit margins, um, that promote from within are perhaps owner, still owner controlled versus those that are more corporate. And I ask that only because my sister and husband both are people who started at cashier level, became store managers, and make the complaints that you discussed about corporate people who've never been in a store making these decisions. And I think first just about how Thanksgiving has gotten shorter and shorter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From a research perspective, I uh, are you talking about owner? When you say owner control, I, are you saying franchise so franchises I'm really or about places where you have these people who've never been at store level? Um, and, and I think when you said that your owner decided not to sell to an oil company, I wonder if Quick Trip would still be considered sort of a model retailer had had made that sale. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We would look just like a major oil convenience store. And I will tell you, those people, I was in a meeting, uh, it's been 20 years ago, and I was invited, and the 16 major oil marketers were there in Quick Trip, and it was a benefits meeting, and the one gentleman said, I figured out a way you don't have to offer 401k to your convenience store employees. And me, being very naive, kind of raised my hand, and I go, why would you want to do that, right? And it just t changed the whole tone of the meeting, but that is, that's exactly where we would be today. And they cut off your hand. Yeah, <laughs> they, did, they did invite me back. 